So let's begin with somebody who uh, is going to wow us with, with some spectacular images, images that have uh, an important purpose behind them. Uh, he is a um, renowned National Geographic photographer uh, who comes from the wilds of Nebraska. I, I don't know how that happened, but there is, yeah, yeah. The Serengeti of the U.S. out there. <laughs> Joel Sartori, give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> So I thought I would just uh, uh, start in today. If we can turn the lights down, that would be great, since it's, you know, pictures and all. It'd be great to be able to see them. You know, I'm known for doing natural history work, and that's what I thought we'd talk about today. I, I always get asked um, one question. You know, when you go out on these assignments, you know, have you ever come close to being killed? And uh, one lady asked me if I ever had been killed on assignment yet. <laughs> not really, not yet, but... Actually, the worst bird I've ever had to photograph, we had the GBH crew with me, and they got to film this. God, there we go, Red. This is like a $6,000 camera. Doesn't he know that? Hey, 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 hey. Ow. God damn. Do you like this bird? All right, done. Thank God. Not very nice. But, uh... A more recent story on koalas in northern Australia. The koala in northern Australia, it's in trouble. And these pictures may look cute, and they may draw readers in the story, which is great. But they allow us to publish something like this that really speaks to why koalas are in trouble. They're out of habitat in many places in northern Australia. So when you see koalas trapped in these urban areas, about ready to be hit by a car or, or bitten clean through the skull by a dog, I knew that there was one wildlife hospital that would save one week's worth of dead koalas in a freezer, including this mom and daughter there in the lower corner. And this picture, when it was published, went around the world, went viral, and the government of Australia had been resisting listing the, the koala as imperiled. And a couple months after we published this, it got listed. And this picture helped. I can't say it did the whole thing, but it helped. So the photo arc, as we call it, we're using these black and white backgrounds to, as a great equalizer to try to get all animals an equal footing or an equal say, whether you're a, a weird looking black lemur or a cheetah or a bobtail squid. The goal is to make all creatures, great and small, valuable in people's eyes and to get people to just look animals into the, in the eye, if they have eyes, and to fall in love with them, or to think that they're weird or interesting or ferocious or colorful or anthropomorphic, whatever it takes to get them into the tent of conservation and get them to realize that there's value here, maybe value that we had not even thought of. This one's gone extinct in the 10 years I've been doing the photo arc now, and this, and this, and this, and this. It's not just little stuff we're driving away, though. It's, it's the big stuff, too. And so they allowed me to paint that background black, we dial down the lights, we dial up in the flash, zoom in. South China tiger, it's one of the world's rarest big mammals. I like to do primates as well, as much as I can, because they seem to connect a lot. We have this National Geographic Instagram, reaches more than 60 million people every time we post. Primates by far get the biggest response. We can get hundreds of thousands of, of likes with uh, still photographs being posted, and it's, it's re really remarkable, and we can see what turns people on. They love baby animals. Baby animals are a big, big deal. Colorful, weird, of course. This one's a proboscis monkey. He has to lift his snout up to eat. That's our 6,000th, right? We're going to 12, every animal in captivity in the world, there's about 12,000. That's the halfway point. That happened last summer at Singapore. Most of the public doesn't know what the word biodiversity means, but they know what cute is. And that's a way of getting people into the tent. If they get into the tent, and usually it's through some mammal with big eyes, maybe we can teach them about the fact that all of us can do something. And I used to be satisfied with that. That's enough. And now, you know, in the last few months, I'm thinking, that's not good enough. So I'm going to, I'm going to morph the photo arc a bit and make it so that we literally lead people to get them to take action. And I want to start with pollinators, because pollinators, that's something all of us can work on. If we have a yard, we can quit using chemicals on the yard, and we can plant uh, milkweed to get monarchs back. It's something that's easy to do, cheap to do, and yields enormous results. People can see the results in a season. So that's where we're going to try to take people. So you know, the good news is that 85, 90% of what I've shown you today can be saved, but it really will take the public to get involved. And I, I believe in public involvement. I think that when people see a need, they rush to fill it. Um, 